Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth. On Now You Know. This week's show is sponsored by our friends at the Schaumburg, Illinois, Fairfield Inn and Suites by Marriott. What makes them special, Jesse? Well, they are the only hotel in the Chicago area that are solar powered. Yeah, they are. All right, so we're going to be covering in this in depth another fantastic article by Ross Tessian in Seeking Alpha. Now, you might be saying Seeking Alpha. Oh, no, because Seeking Alpha has lots of stories that are very fuddy. Right. Ross is one of these people who does not write FUD articles. He writes super well-researched articles, and he just publishes them to Seeking Alpha. That's there, right. There are many writers of Seeking Alpha. He is one of them. This is one of his articles. Yeah, and we're going to take you through how Rivian's latest truck reveal and GM's factory shutdown now fits in with the decimation of big oil and big auto. Mm -hmm. So let's dive right in. All right, so I want to start by pulling a gem of a chart out of Ross's article. This here sets the stage. It shows the adoption of technology in the United States from 1900 to present. Mm -hmm. So what's the first thing you think of when you see this chart, Jess? Uh, it's a rainbow. Yeah, it looks like a rainbow. It's a big, messy, squiggly bunch of lines. It's right. hard to understand. So, so let's, let's break it down. Yeah, okay. The first line on the left is a big, dark blue line that shows that the telephone took 70 years to be adopted from about... 10% adoption to 80% adoption. Wow, who was in like 1960 who didn't have a telephone? Well, think about the lot parts of the country had to be wired. So if your town wasn't wired That's for true. a telephone, you know, it wasn't cheap. Like That's it true. took a long time to actually physically, technologically wire up the country. Wow, okay. Next line is electricity. And that took 35 years for very similar reasons. If you didn't have a line going to your house with electricity, mm -hmm. you didn't have electricity. Wow. Next is ice cars. That took 50 years and that's because... They're not cheap. They're expensive, and they, they had horses. Why give up my horse? Right. I mean, I just feed him some hay, and I don't have to go to the gas station. Right. <laughs> but then we start to see some interesting things happen. So next is radio, and that only took 15 years, mm -hmm. and that's because radios weren't that expensive, and they got cheaper and cheaper. Refrigerators, that took 18 years, because some people still had ice boxes for a while, and right. why they switch a, from they that? They had a good alternative. Next is black and white TVs. That only took eight years. Yeah. Wow. To 80% adoption. That's amazing. Now, color TV took a little longer, 10 years. Why do you think that is? They had a pretty decent alternative. Yeah, already got a TV. Don't right. need your color whippersnapper <laughs> thing. Right. Credit cards took a bit longer, 35 years, and that's because you went from paying cash to using credit, which is a huge shift in how you would think right. about spending money. I think a lot of people balked at that. And still do. Next is microwave ovens. That only took nine years. The PC took 25 years, but that's because they weren't cheap when they first came out. They yeah. cost thousands they of dollars. Room size. And they didn't do much. I mean, let's right. be honest, yeah. they word processing. Next is a cell phone. That took nine years. Now we see wow. this clump of, of lines, and that is internet, digital camera, MP3 players, HDTV, social media, smartphones, tablets. What do those lines look like to you? Straight lines, vertical. They're just going whoop. As yeah. soon as the technology comes out, it's like a matter of weeks and months before you get it. Right. It, so it's not the years that we're talking about before. Like, ah, maybe I'll get the telephone in in fourteen more years or something. <laughs> you know, some crazy thing like that. Right. It's just like, okay, Christmas. I guess I'll I'll get a, a an MP3 player. Exactly. So what does this chart look like? Uh, adoption is accelerating. These things that, you know, usually would have taken decades now take a matter of years. Right. That's because technology is right. accelerating. Wow. Because when we introduce a new technology, it can get to all of us faster and cheaper faster. So keep these adoption curves in mind and how they are accelerating. Now, Ross points out that many analyst graphs that try to predict the future of the shift from ICE to EV sales look like this doesn't really look like those adoption curves that we were looking at before. Right. It, See that yellow like, line? Right. There's like a little there's like a little bit of an S curve and then it goes, I'm going to go linearly up to 80%. Right. That's not how it works. Not how it because works. Because as more people get it, more people want to get it. If and it's the a price good technology, down. right? Exactly. Ross says that can't be right. So what is going to happen to ICE car sales? It's not going to obviously follow that curve. So as Ross points out, there are two problems with this graph. One, doesn't look like a typical disruption curve. And two, and I'm quoting here, the decision to purchase a new car is separate from and independent of the decision to purchase an EV instead of an ICE vehicle. When someone decides their next car will be an EV, sales of ICE vehicles drop immediately. However, EV sales do not grow until that person finds an EV with features and price that meets that person's needs. So there's a gap. 
basically. There's exactly. a gap between when someone gets in a Model 3, because I've seen I've seen this. Mm -hmm. People will get in a Model 3 or many different EVs. Mm -hmm. You get them in an EV, you show them what it can do, and the, the switch the in their brain yep. goes, wow, I this is amazing. I don't want to drive my Honda Civic to work anymore. Mm -hmm. Many different reasons why you might want to switch to an EV. Right. And all of a sudden, you're not thinking about, okay, I'm going to get a new car. Right. You're just thinking about, I'm going to get an EV. When can I get it? And when can I afford it? Right. So it's important to not get lost on this step. When someone realizes that they want an EV, they will wait for up to three or four years until they can buy that EV, even if the EV they want isn't available yet. Meanwhile, what happens to ICE sales? They, they plummet. They stop happening because... That that person who oh, was they're waiting right who is going to in one or two years buy an ice car doesn't show up at the dealership that day and the dealer goes huh business seems a little slow oh must be the weather or something like that but in reality the people who were going to be showing up that day are waiting for their dream EV exactly so based on Ross's analysis and his number crunching ice car sales will approach zero around 2026 and EVs will approach 1 billion EVs on the road by 2032. So now let's introduce oil into this equation. Oil surpluses, or a glut of oil, is going to happen around 2023. Hmm. Well, I can't quite keep all of this in my head. I know. What does it hard. look like? You know, what are we talking about here? Here's a chart that Ross made to help visualize this. Mm -hmm. Blue is ice car sales. So what are those doing? They are going down. Red is EV sales. What's that look like? They are going up. Yeah, S curve. Exactly. Just a regular adoption curve that we're used to seeing. Exactly. And I mean, this one is slower than, say, tablets. But I mean, that's because cars are, are more, more expensive, expensive than tablets. You got it. Okay. So now green line is ICE plus EV sales. So you see how it goes down at first because there's not enough EVs being produced and people are waiting for them. Mm -hmm. And then as EVs get produced enough, it starts to go back up so wait you're saying around 2025 2026 you're saying that there's just going to be less cars on the road or something like i mean if the if the ice sales are going down and the ev sales are going up but they haven't caught up with each other yet there's going to be a lot of used ice cars on the road a lot of cars that need repairing so you're saying that like if you're a mechanic shop that's the year that's the year and it's going to be misleading because you're going to think, oh my God, if this trend continues, I'm going to be fixing cars for the rest of my life. You're, you're seeing, you're seeing a, a graph that goes, right? You're thinking, ah, business is going up right. for mechanics. And then it's going to go, it's as gonna everyone starts buying new EVs. Exactly. And, well, they just don't need that kind of maintenance. Right. So we're pointing this out. Ross is pointing it out so that you can kind of get a glimpse of what's coming down the road. Okay. So what's this purple line here? That purple line is oil in millions of barrels per day. So what do you? What does that look like it's doing? It is dropping off pretty, right. pretty steadily. Yeah. And so basically by 2023, there's going to be an oil glut. So what you need for an oil glut is to have less demand for oil. And when you hit about a million barrels per day of less demand, mm -hmm. you get an oil glut. So a million barrels per day of overproduction, basically. Right. Now we're going to see that later in the article, so okay. hang on to that little nugget of information. So let's talk about passenger car sales in the U.S. They are down dramatically, and most analysts in big auto attribute this to what? Changing consumer preference. Yeah, and they're right about that, except for one key point. What do they attribute that changing consumer preference to? Oh, well, they think that everyone is, is ditching their sedans for SUVs and pickup trucks. Wrong. wrong. But they're wrong? Yeah. Why? The sales of passenger cars are down because a large number of consumers have realized that EVs are superior and they're either buying EVs instead or they're waiting for an EV. The one segment where there isn't much choice yet is SUVs and pickup trucks. And that is why that ICE segment is still doing okay. And that's what's misleading everyone in Big Auto. But there are already first movers in this space. The Rivian R1T just came out the other day along with the Rivian R1S. The Bollinger the workhorse W15, the Havilar Bison, and soon will be Tesla, who will also be entering the pickup truck space. So GM recently said they won't be working on an EV pickup truck or SUV. And Ross thinks that this is a misdirection. Why? So GM only has two choices. They can either say that we're going to come out with an electric pickup truck. Right. Why, why wouldn't they do that? Well, if they say that, what happens to their existing customers who are just about to buy a new pickup truck? They won't buy the pickup truck because they're worried about maintenance and it being 
you know, covered and, and, and also why why buy a worse technology if GM is switching. Right. And it's going to take GM and Ford years to actually come out with this pickup truck. So for years, they'll have no sales. I see. And But what's the other option? The other option is say, we're not working on an EV pickup truck or SUV. Keep buying your, your GM and Fords. I see. So for a while, they're basically just lying to everyone saying, there, you don't need electric pickup trucks. Keep buying our gas ones instead. Right. Well, there is a third option. Okay. And that would be that they say, we're not working on electric pickup trucks, and they're not. That's true. It's possible. I think that that probably would be the worst option. That would be the worst because... option for them. Ross thinks that this is a misdirection. He thinks mm -hmm. that GM and Ford are working on them and just can't tell anyone because mm -hmm. the second they do, their sales will drop. And those sales will start to drop fast because it's hard for uh, big auto to ramp up production fast enough to catch on to this trend. It doesn't even matter if they can hold off on this misdirection for long enough because all of these other competitors are entering the space. Right. What they were kind of banking on, I think, was that the Rivian was going to be kind of just a meh, kind of sort of like a, a workhorse-y kind of meh-ish mm -hmm. um, truck. Not that workhorse couldn't work or anything like that, but I'm saying, you know, it's not as exciting as the Rivian or that the, the Tesla pickup truck wouldn't come out on time or it would be dumb somehow they're just hoping that there would be no one in this space and they would be safe for a while there'd and, be this little safe right haven. and and let's re remind everyone gm is closing factories right now because the cars they're making nobody wants to to buy and right. that's just the passenger vehicles because there's now competition in mm -hmm. that field as soon as there's competition in the truck field they'll be closing those plants as well right so let's go to this question that that ross brings up could Tesla acquire Ford when Ford goes bankrupt? That's a question. Yeah. So, I mean, when Elon tweeted back in June that Tesla had hit 7,000 cars in seven days, Ford's president for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, he tweeted, 7,000 cars, circa four hours, heart Ford team. Now, as Ross and we pointed out at the time, this makes people who don't understand disruptions laugh at how small and inconsequential Tesla seems. But we know that this is just ignorance and it's ignoring the new trend. Right. It's kind of like if you were Kodak making fun of a new digital camera company in the beginning of digital cameras going like, huh, nobody's buying those silly digital cameras. Right. And now try and find a film camera. Exactly. Ford is wasting resources building hybrids and they have $222 billion in total liabilities on their books. Billion with a B. Yeah. So look how quickly US passenger car sales market has tanked. When EV options for pickups and SUVs come out, this will happen in that segment too, and then game over, ice. And that's the gap that we're talking about. That's that gap in total car sales. Right. It's going to be this weird period where you don't see new cars on the road, right? and everyone's going to the mechanic shop. All the mechanic yep. shops are booked all yes. the time. It's a good time to be a mechanic. A mechanic, as long as you're cutting and running. Right. You got to sell that shop while it's still a little hot. You gotta Some call it. Dope. You gotta call it. You know, like <laughs> Doug's Ice and EV shop. Yeah, or maybe something. it would definitely be smart to be training up some some technicians yes. on EVs. All right, now let's put oil into this equation. Right. So I mean, let's go back to the chart and that purple line just kind of slowly dips off. You're saying there's going to be some kind of a bad thing that happens based yeah, well, on so, based okay. on what? Well, as Ross points out, in 2014, oil producers overproduced by about 1.5 million barrels per day. And this is what happened to oil prices in that year. <whistles> Went from over $100 a barrel to down around $40 a barrel. Wow. Just because they were overproducing. There was still plenty of demand. Mm -hmm. To keep an oil glut from happening, these cast of characters, and here's the pie chart here showing you who the cast of characters are, they have to work together to reduce supplies when... EVs start increasing demand. So, so here's the cast of characters. Russia, US, Saudi Arabia, China, Iran, Canada, <laughs> Iraq, Kuwait. They all have to get along and go, Oh, comrade, USA, of course, we all cut production, make less money to make a good oil price. Sounds good, partner. Very good. All yes. right. Not going to happen. Can you picture that? Now, right. here's the thing. EVs are already reducing demand by 250,000 barrels of oil a day. That's already happening because largely because of electric buses. Right. So all we need to do is get to about a million barrels per day and this glut will start to happen. When that happens, to keep the glut from happening, all these oil producers will have to get together and reduce production. Now you say, maybe that could happen. Ross isn't the only one saying this mm -hmm. can happen. This Bloomberg chart shows the same thing, that by 2023, that's when we expect there to be this million barrel per day oil glut. Now, you might say... 
well, all they have to do is just cut production enough to keep that from happening. But let's take a look at this. 56% of global oil demand comes from transportation. Problem for oil producers in 2023 will be that each year it will get worse for them as more and more EVs are sold. So there'll be less and less oil demand and the price of oil will drop more and more and they'll want to sell more and more to make up for that loss. Right, which just increases the supply and therefore lowers the price. Right, so you're losing money. You're an oil producing country. That's your one big revenue source. Mm -hmm. You're losing money from it every year more and more. The price is dropping per barrel more and more. Right. You're going to want to do what? Sell more. Sell more. That's that's all you've got. Right. This is what's going to cause that little area in 2023 to be cheap gasoline. And so all those used ice cars will be very attractive. There'll be a very attractive ice used market out there. Mm -hmm. And so that will mislead people again into thinking like, oh, EVs are done. It's only a short period where this happens. Mm -hmm. Ross goes on to explain that starting in 2016, the U.S. reversed a 40-year ban on selling U.S. crude oil reserves. So the U.S. for decades stored oil in case there was a global meltdown, right? Mm -hmm. But in 2016, they reversed that and started selling oil. Why? Uh, it seems like bad strategy. It seems like you're in trouble. You're just inviting yourself for trouble. They finally figured this out, which Ross has just figured out, which mm -hmm. is that there's going to be a glut of oil and there's no reason to hold it any longer. In fact, get rid of it at higher prices. So you, we're just expecting the price to drop on it. So why would you hold a useless commodity? Exactly. For years, we were told there's going to be this thing called peak oil and we're going to run out of oil. So you better hoard it. Now that we've got new technology and we're able to drill pretty much everywhere and find oil, there's not going to be peak oil. There's going to be a glut of oil. And so that's why even the U.S., this is kind of proving his argument, mm -hmm. the U.S. is dumping oil. If you want to learn more about what oil companies to start shorting, I urge you to read Ross's article. All right, so to summarize, if you've just been kind of zoning out during this because you're like, there's too many charts and graphs, I think this one chart explains it best. Let's go back to it. Ice car sales are going to zero quickly. An oil glut could happen around 2023, and EV sales will continue to take off. Look for big oil and big auto to really start hurting soon, especially when the EV, SUVs, and pickup trucks start rolling out in full. If you're thinking that 2023 still sounds far away, because I know you're all thinking, you're like, well, it's still 2018. Right. Think about what you were doing in 2013, because that's the same amount of time back as we're talking about going forward. Does 2013 feel to you like it was like back in the old days not really no it's and i mean i'm young recent. so it's that's a big chunk of my life right there right i mean you were in college right and so it's not far away i think so many people think well this is just decades away if ross is right with his projections and i think they're actually kind of conservative this is all going to be happening very soon it's true it's it, again, it goes back to the accelerated growth curves that we're seeing. Things happen faster. You can get a factory up and running far faster than you used to be able to before. You can get robots in there. You can start producing faster and faster than we ever could before. Right. And I mean, keep in mind, in 2013, the Model S was basically the only electric car that could go over 200 miles. Right. Now we have so many more options, and they're just continuing to grow in number. And I mean, Rivian just followed in Tesla's footsteps. They found an, a, a Mitsubishi factory that was selling dirt cheap. They secretly, you know, started building a luxury SUV and pickup truck. Mm -hmm. It's going to be expensive, but it's going to be amazing when it comes out. Right. And and here's one thing that I think that a lot of people kind of miss. They, they look at the front of the truck and they go, oh, that thing's ugly. No one's going to buy it. And oh, it's going to be so expensive. No one's going to buy it. Not everyone has to buy the Rivian truck for them to make a huge impact in the market, right? Okay, they have to make a tiny little blip, okay? Because right now all they need to do is raise more money. Mm -hmm. And they can do that by selling a luxury, high margin exactly. pickup truck. Just and, like Tesla did. And they don't have to sell it to everyone on the street. They just have to sell a few tens of thousands they're, of them. They're creating a luxury brand name right. just like Tesla so that when you hear Rivian, you'll think luxury. Then if they release a lower priced pickup truck, which shouldn't be hard to do, right. you'll be like, I'm buying a Rivian too. Right. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's exactly what Tesla did. I think that it's a really, really smart move. And, and I mean, people think that like, oh, Teslas are too expensive. Therefore, no one buys a Tesla. That is not the case. People buy Teslas. Now that the Model 3 comes down, obviously more people buy Teslas, but people have been buying Model S's since it came out. 
And that is kind of what made Tesla possible, is the people buying Model S's, the people buying Model X's. These are really, really expensive cars. Normal people do not have these cars. Right. And now they're finally producing Model 3's, which can actually be bought by normal people. Yeah, I urge you to read Ross's article, fantastic. We only kind of touched the surface. It's a real deep dive. He's got all the facts and figures to back it up. And we really want to give a shout out to Ross for writing these fantastic articles. So go check that out. Thank you so much for joining us here on In Depth this week. We really appreciate you joining us every week. And don't forget, subscribe and like our episodes. It really helps us out a lot. All right, thank you so much for watching. Now, now you know. know.